So today, uh, the, the main safety systems in the car uh, are the uh, restraint systems. Uh, the belt restraint, the head restraint, the driver's nets, and reinforced seats. And I hope that whatever, whatever form of racing you're in or do, that you can use some of this stuff and it will apply to your, your cars and your series. So we talk about restraint systems. Uh, you know, the most popular that I see out there today is a, a five-point system. Uh, we used that in NASCAR a, a while back. We've, uh, we've now gone through the six-point system to a seven-point system, and you can see that on your right. Uh, a seven-point system has two shoulder straps, uh, two lap belt, uh, a lap belt, uh, the uh, anti-sub straps that go rearward, and then uh, a negative G strap, which is really the old five-point crotch belt. And, and the reason that is, is uh, when, when, you, when you have a five-point system in a frontal accident, your pelvis moves forward, and that increases the load on the shoulder belts. And when the shoulder belt load goes up, you get more chest compression. And I can show you some data. So here, here's a test where you put a dummy on a sled and you stop him, in this case at Wayne State, very suddenly. Uh, this, this test was done at 30 mile an hour, doesn't sound too fast. Uh, a 31G stop, which is 31 times the force of gravity. This would be a, a moderate collision. And what we see here, uh, the chest compression is shown as the y-axis. And you can see here that with a six-point harness, you're only getting about 25 millimeters of chest compression. With a five-point harness, you're getting over 50. Well, 50 millimeters is two inches, and as you sit here and push in on your chest, when you get to two inches, things start to crack and break. Not a good thing. So now we'll talk about head and neck restraints. Uh, you probably know that uh, they're very they're mandated in all our series. Um, and I would hope that when I get done today, you'll be convinced that if you see drivers without a head restraint, that this is a, this is a very, very critical need. Uh, it's something that every driver should have. Uh, in NASCAR, we learned uh, at the turn of the century, we had a, a bunch of fatalities, and I'll show you those. I'll show you how they work and what the injury mechanism is. So in a period of 17 months, uh, we lost five drivers. The most famous, of course, is Dale Earnhardt. Uh, Blaze Alexander was in an ARCA car, but ARCA is uh, very closely related to NASCAR. And at the end of 2001, NASCAR took steps to, to go ahead and put head restraints in mandatory. Uh, you'll notice that uh, in, when Dale Earnhardt died, there were six drivers in that race that had head restraints. So they had started to filter in, but they hadn't been mandated. So here's how it works. You can see the blue part there is either a carbon fiber or a plastic injection molded piece. And the, uh, what happens in a frontal crash, and I'll show you the sled test, the, the belt restraints will restrain the torso, and then the head will flip forward, and the weight of the, the head and the helmet combined raise the tension in the neck. And when the tension gets up to around 900 pounds, you have a fracture at the base of the skull, and uh, that generally is fatal. In, in a racing type environment. Here's a more dramatic piece that shows you what happens. So that's what I just explained about the 900 uh, pounds. We use Newtons, 4,000 Newtons. 
So I'll show you a sled comparison of the two. Uh, first of all, I need to explain a safety sled. There are two types of sled. The data I showed you with the Wayne State sled, it comes down the track suddenly and stops in a controlled fashion. Uh, the more modern sleds that we use are reverse acceleration sleds where the dummy sits on the buck and the sled is accelerated backwards. And of course, you know, uh, reaction forces are the same as stopping suddenly. We run our test at 70 G's and 40 miles an hour. So that's, that's up at the highest level of any of the crashes that we see. Now this is a baseline test. Yeah, this is no Hans and watch the head and the neck and you'll see a, a big tension. Uh, yeah, we'll play that one more time. Now the point of peak tension is really not at the end, it's right now. You can see the Hans in place now. The head will move, but it stays more with the torso. Could you run that one more time? To give you an idea of this test, the 70G pulse, you just saw that sled accelerated from zero to 40 miles an hour in 50 milliseconds. So it, you, if you're there watching, you can't see it. This is a thousand frames a second. So the sled is here and now it's gone. And then you go out and you check the dummy. So here's, without the Hans, you can see here that the neck tension is over 4,000 newtons. So that dummy, that was a fatal accident, okay, that you just saw. Let me. With the Hans, you see the, the neck tension is 1,820 newtons, far below the 4,000. So the whole idea is to keep the head with the torso, don't let it flip. Here are two, uh, two Hans devices that are approved. We have other devices. These are hybrid devices. All these devices are sold by Simpson Performance. Now we'll talk about nets. They were first used in uh, 2003 by the Corvette team. Uh, they were required in SCCA Pro. They were required in IMSA in 2009. And just this year, FIA in Europe has required them in all cars and all rally cars and all sports cars. The, the function of the net is you need, you need something to catch the head in a side impact. The head restraint will only protect you uh, from 45 degrees right to 45 degrees left, as, as the diagram shows. If you, go, if you go further than 45 degrees, your head goes over the top of the head restraint, so you need either a very good seat, which I'll show you, or you need a net. So if you don't have, if you don't have real good seats, uh, you'll need a net. Now, some seats look like they're good with shoulder support and head support, but if you can bend, if you can move that seat with your hand, it's, it's not a good seat, not for restraint. So there's a picture of me. That's a, the that's a first net that went in at Sebring in 2003 in the Corvette. So there's a certain orientation here. You need to pick up the shoulder, you need to pick up the head. So that's, that's how you put the net in the car. And there's an SAE, SAE paper on that. Again, this is 35 mile an hour. Now watch the head in the side impact. And this is, this is with a Hans device, okay? So you can see that that, that was not a good outcome. Yeah, 
You'll notice the net looks very loose, but again, uh, that net was tight. But this is such a violent stop that the net looks like it waves in the wind. Now we can look. What's that? What would that speed equate to on the track? We're looking at well, this, this is a 35 mile an hour stop. This would be a pretty severe hit in a side impact on the, on the track. And, you know, I didn't bring any slides to show you that when you're going 160 mile an hour and you hit the wall at 15 degrees, that that's about 40 mile an hour, okay? Uh, everybody says he hit the wall at 160. Well, he really only hit the wall at 40, and then he continued down the track at 140. You know, so there's, it's all, it all has to do with the, actually the geometry of the crash. So here, here's the same kind of data. And you can see again, the same, the same rules apply at 4,000. Without the net, we're up to 6,000 on neck tension with the net, we're down kind of below 2,000 most of the time. So that, that's what, and nets are very cheap, so you can put them in a car that already exists and uh, give the driver a lot more protection. And they're pretty transparent to driving and seeing out, and they, they have a quick disconnect, so you can quickly disconnect them to climb out. So now we'll talk about seats. Uh, early seats uh, were just modified passenger cars. Uh, later, aluminum bucket seats uh, were used. You've seen them. We still use aluminum in NASCAR. We use carbon fiber and aluminum. We have seven seat manufacturers that will pass our test. So the reinforced seat came into being uh, around the turn of the century, became popular. It actually gives you better driver feel too because it's rigid with the car and when you go through corners, you don't bend, you, you actually feel what the car is doing. And then I'll explain the all belts to seat. So here's an early example. This is David Pearson in 1963 and you can see that's just a passenger car seat and he's added a bolster to keep him from sliding off no shoulder harness. This is a lap belt only. And this is an example here. I'll show a video of Johnny Benson uh, in an ASA race in 1992. And you can see what happens in a side impact. Now this side impact probably only had the equivalent of about a 25 mile an hour barrier impact, but you'll see what happens to Johnny. There's a side slap. Now they'll go inside the car. You can see he has what looks like shoulder and head support, but they don't do, any, do anything in this crash. Okay, now he survived that, obviously. He later went on to be a truck champion. I, I tell Johnny I, I need to give him a dollar for every time I've shown this. He was the ASA champion too. This is early video. So you can see and that, that really gets to the drivers better than any of the dummy uh, things I show them because it's an actual driver going through this sort of thing. Now, why Johnny didn't have a, a problem with his neck, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons, a lot having to do with the individual too. And, uh, and, and may, maybe his, his harness wasn't really good enough to, to stop his torso. In those days, they, the harnesses weren't as good either. So reinforced seats. Uh, this again was started uh, in 1993 by John Melvin, and John was my mentor for many years. He passed away two years ago, but he knew most of the drivers, and he was a sports car driver himself, so he knew, he knew about racing. 
So the basic elements are to support the pelvis, the shoulder, and the head. And there's an SAE paper on that if you want to get it. So we have a seat spec, SFI is a, is a group out in California that puts specifications in rule books and, and most sanctioning bodies are SFI members. So there's a quasi-static uh, test criteria. Uh, the load on the head support, we run to 2,000 pounds and it can't deflect more than half an inch. So you know what that means, that's very stiff. The shoulder has to go 3,000 pounds and the pelvis has to go 4,000 pounds. And again, there are seven seat manufacturers that can do that. Here's the test. Uh, I won't bore you with it. it you, you don't have to show that one. No, I don't want that. On, on this test, the, the, the hemisphere comes in, pushes. It's, uh, it's pretty boring. Now, here, here are some pictures of drivers in seats. Um, this was taken a few years ago. The only change that I would say you would see today is the driver on your left um, would, today, the head support comes in very much closer. Again, work we've done in the past few years to show that the head support and the foam in the head support has to be close to the helmet, and, and I'll show you why that why that is. And you can see on the, on the right hand side, you can see how high it comes and we need that head support to catch the center of gravity of the helmet in a crash. Here's a sled test comparison. This is a, a seat validation that we do. This was done at MGA up in Wisconsin. Again, this is a thousand frames a second. So you can see how far the head goes into that foam. We require on the right hand side four inches of very hard foam and that's to stop the head because the, the, the helmet will go about halfway through that on this crash test. Now the relationship uh, of the distance between the padding and the, the helmet uh, is very important. Here you can see I ran two tests uh, back to back. The, the test on the left is a two inch gap. The test on the right is a one inch gap. Now the, the tests look very similar, but the data, was, uh, the data was quite a bit different. So I'll show you the data from that. In this graph, you can see the acceleration to the head with a two inch gap is about 215 G's and with a one inch gap it's about 160 G's so there's a 55 G difference in head acceleration for one inch gap. So that means you need a rigid seat, you need that foam right up against the helmet. You don't want to get a running start at it. Something we call a slide hammer effect. So in, in our rules we you, you still may use some comfort foam, which is the soft stuff, but you have to keep that to a minimum. And then the SFI foam is very hard, as I, as I said. And it must be covered so that your head, your, your helmet can't dig into the foam. So coming to the end now, we look at 2017 and beyond. Um, we've got all belts to seat now. Um, that is, uh, we require a seven point minimum, uh, and I'll go through these very quickly, but we test the seats, each one of them, the shoulders have to take uh, 9,000 pounds and the, the uh, lap belts and anti-submarine belts have to take 6,000 pounds and the anti-G has to take 4,000 pounds. So you can do this in either carbon or aluminum. The seats are expensive, but uh, the drivers don't mind. Here's a T uh, setup. Uh, my engineer at the time put all this together. It's a hydraulic setup that automatically pulls on all of the, uh, all of the anchor points at one time. So where are we today? I've got some video here. 
Uh, the first is the Camping World truck accident at Daytona. The second is uh, the number 10 car at Daytona. And then uh, the last one is a, a Sprint Cup. Uh, yeah, this is the number 10 car. This is Danica Patrick at Daytona. You'll see the in car. She takes her hands off the wheel. That's, that's IndyCar experience. But you can see how much head movement she got. Uh, you know, her, here's a slow motion going into the safer barrier. That was a big hit. You can see the safer barrier uh, kind of wrinkle there. I think they may have had to replace that section of the safer barrier. Again, watch the head. Now, uh, this is, of course, uh, 30 frames a second. Uh, next year, we're going to have 300 frames a second in, in all the cup cars. So we'll be able to watch that head movement and see exactly where, where the driver goes. She climbed out of the car fine. Yeah, this is Michael McDowell. This is at Texas during qualifying. Uh, I happened to be there that day, but now he hit the wall going 180, but he had about a, he probably had about a 60 mile an hour into the wall. I talked to him after the wreck. His leg hurt a little bit, but he was otherwise, in fact, this was qualifying, so the next day he, uh, he raced. The future plans, uh, we're going to have high-speed video next year, uh, and we're, we're improving the side impact structure, and you'll see a video of that. We're, we're going to put uh, load cells in the not-too-distant future on the belts so that we'll be able to see what the belt loads are. This, uh, this test was done nearby at TRC, near Columbus, Ohio, and uh, it's a 100-mile-an-hour side impact. We just did this last, last year. So I'd like to acknowledge my, my immediate uh, boss, John Padillac, uh, John Melvin, who I mentioned before, who is deceased, uh, Bob Hubbard, who I just saw two weeks ago. He's up in Lansing at uh, Michigan State. Um, Bob invented the Hans, and then Paul Begeman down at, uh, or up at Wayne State University. Thank you.